California, the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network presents Flying High Over the Zone with the Zigzag Man. We are back and you are flying high with me, the Zigzag Man, over the zone, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network from Alameda, California, the northern part of the great state of California. Uh, right across the bay from San Francisco in the East Bay, right near Oakland. Give you an idea where I am. I want to know where in Maine is my guest, Christopher White. Give me a give me a hint. Clue me in, man. <laughs> I am in Bangor, or Bangor, as, as some Bangor, may say. Bangor, Maine. I am in Bangor, Bangor tonight. Maine. Wasn't there a song that with those lyrics? <laughs> I, I can't can't think of it, but um, nice to I, talk to you after all these years. Uh, we go back a long way. You did comedy back in uh, the day, the 80s and early 90s, when I did at the Holy City Zoo. Absolutely. And, and um, well, it was not, you know, Facebook is a wonderful thing, as we... Uh, at least I not approach retirement age. I'm right in the middle of it um, as we approach um, <laughs> the very, very end. It's nice to have uh, a way to connect with people in our lives that um, we might not have even known very well. I knew you in passing. I'll tell you where I remember knowing you best. You and I both did um, extra work in San Francisco. Do you, you remember that? I do. I, I actually do. Um, I, you know, it was, it was a way to pick up 20 bucks or 25 bucks for the day or something like that. And, you know, Absolutely. They, they feed you. They, there's a bunch of women around to look at where you can hang. Exactly. Um, uh, and every now and again you're in a scene and a TV show comes on and you go, look at that guy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's I, 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 I played many a, many a corpse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I do in real life, as a matter of fact. Oh, well, yeah. So, I uh, yeah, those are they, they, there was a, an agency in the marina. District. Right. Do you remember that? I do. Uh, uh, what was the woman's name? Wow. Well, uh, I'd have to show you. have to yeah. a picture of her butt. <laughs> I can't. Um, I, I really have have no Sheila comes to mind or ah oh, it's, it's it, I, I I you could say you could say anything and I would be okay yeah that's probably it yeah but if you smile to her and if you're nice and it just took a little human interaction she'd uh, yeah be way to go uh, um, there's so many jerks in this world that's about, about um, it makes it easy for people who can communicate. And, um, yeah. don't have an axe to grind with anybody. And uh, for, uh, at least speaking for myself, I'm really not all that pro-work over, over the course of the <laughs> lifetime. I've done it. I've added it all up, you know. <laughs> I've given myself yeah. a report card. Um, I've got Maynard Krebitis, which... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was great. He, he lives on through you. I think that's... Yes, he does. Got a, a little Gilligan too through me, but uh, may, mostly Maynard. Work, work. work. Dude, work. Don't scare me. Oh, really good, yeah. Maynard, we're going into Dad's grocery store to do some stocking, and all of a sudden, Doby would look around. Maynard was gone. Was he's gone. Ready? What? Gone. Yeah. <laughs> So give me some, let's talk some memories of the zoo. Tell me the first time you got up on stage, the Holy City Zoo, for those out there who don't um, don't know, in the 80s, the Holy City Zoo was perhaps the most important comedy club 
in a city that was perhaps the most important influence on comedy at that time. And it was the Holy City Zoo. It was on Clement Street. It was a little dive. And um, it's got so much history. If you go on Facebook, anybody out there listening, uh, Holy City Zoo, just type in Holy City Zoo. You get to the like a reunion site that they have where people get together and chat about the old days and post pictures and what have you. What's your earliest memory? How did you get into comedy? No. And, um, well, well, as far as the zoo goes, I don't really remember my first time there. I mean, I probably did, you know, dozens and dozens of times where, you know, it was an open mic and I happened to get on the list and I went and did a set in front of three or four or ten or even 20 people. Um, right. You know, it, it, was, it was, for me, it's, it's more the interactions there, um, you know, hanging out with all the other comics and, you know, then going down the street to Max's 540 or, you know, and, right. and oh, uh, that was a that. great bar. That, that was that a great thing. Was... And Laura, Laura Hammer was, was, was our bartender down there. Yes, she was. She was tall and stately, and she was a terrific woman. I, Absolutely. Most times, I wonder what happened to her. Uh, she was, um, it was an age that, um, age and time where women were coming into her own, and uh, she was an influence on on a lot of folks. And oh, I think was, so. Uh, it, I lived right ar- around the corner from there. I lived on 4th and... Um, California, oh. between California and uh, Mountain Lake Park, as a matter of fact, and uh, that was within walking distance. It was a beer bar. It was the kind of bar where people. It was the closest thing to Cheers. That yes, that, uh, that I remember. <laughs> I agree. I, am I right? Yeah, you, you walk yeah, in. Uh, absolutely. Um, in in my history of going out and about, let's put it that way. It was a wonderful, it was wonderful times. It was great being straight in San Francisco at those times. Um, <laughs> for me, um, I need all the help I could get, and it was a time when. when I um, <laughs> yes. I, back then, I was actually even good looking. I'm, I'm like old and, you know, you know, lack of oh, hair uh, now. You you may be over the hill, but you had a hill to go I, to the I, I may not have been a good comic, but I, I had a look. I think that's the important thing. <laughs> well, yes, you, you were. You had one of those looks that made the audience dislike you. It's, it's true. It's absolutely true. It's, you were too fucking it, good looking. I'm I don't think it was bad. I just think they just didn't like me. No, I've no, never no. been most likable on stage. No, I don't mean Sometimes that. Sometimes I could force them into liking me, but, but generally. Oh, no, absolutely. But you come on stage, it's like you are this regal guy that would walk on stage. You have blonde hair, and you just come on and look down at, from the stage. And um, it was like um, the Richard Corey thing. That's how I, I looked at it. People would, would look at you, which is a big oh, stretch you have to be. Yeah. Um, so, so as far as as far as memories um, of the zoo, and there's a number of them. Um, uh, one of my favorite memories was actually seeing. I, I, I think I remember one of your uh, podcasts from I don't know when that was when you talked a lot about uh, Benjamin Stewart. Um, so oh, Stu, oh. and I, I remember the the time that the, um, you know, he would sit in the audience and heckle. And, and Lance Sola, who's, who's just still around and he's down in L.A. Um, I've had he, him uh, on the show. Uh, oh, right. he's, he's great. A maybe maybe yeah. you talked about this. Um, but, you know, it's he still was 6'6", six, six, and fun Stu was a little dwarf in the wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I mean, uh, he would be heckling Lance mercilessly from, from the audience and just just all over him. And Lance would appear to finally lose his cool and go down there and pick him up, and people would get all completely freaked out that here's this giant man picking up this little small guy and, you know, and shaking him a little bit, and taking him and throwing him, a lot, in my mind anyway, you know, basically tossing him underneath, you know, onto the stage and putting a chair on top of him and still trying to get out from the chair. It was the funniest thing. Absolutely. It was just, and one of the things that I didn't have to follow. Lance, Lance was the most mellow 
gentle giants in the entire oh, yeah. world. And he, oh, yeah. was, he had the long hair going, and he was, like I say, about 6'6", six, six, about 240, 250. And um, but, so he was able to play that rough and tumble guy. But to know <laughs> one of the guys that was uh, the easiest on one's head when you go in in a very competitive, tense situation is comedy. It's not that, you know, yeah. it, it appears to be fun, and, and, and it is. It's it, it's enjoyable and it's challenging. But, you know, you everybody's trying to, you know, get ahead and this, that, and the other thing. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll trade you one for one. I'm, we'll talk about comedians that had been in the business that helped newcomers. Michael Pritchard. Wow, yeah. is he good. Well, he was good with people. Um, he just was an encouragement. He and Michael Dugan was a, Mike Dugan was another one that I, I remember very very supportive to young in the business comics and weren't condescending. Ed Krasnick was that way. Maria Falzone was that way. Um, it was a good time to good time to be in comedy in the eighties in San Francisco. Well, I, it, it was. It was. I, I, I try to look at it as. I got there in 88, and I'd been doing comedy for maybe a year. Um, uh, I'd gotten into some trouble in uh, San Diego, and I kind of fled the city, so to speak, went east, um, went to Nashville, and had had determined some months before that I, was, I wanted to try and start doing it, and I got a job at uh, Zane's in Nashville. And uh, there I, I, well, I, I got a job in the, in the club as a, as a cook. Um, so I was able to be there and be able to get in open mics and do that kind of thing. And um, my first paying comedy gig for a strip club uh, in Nashville called the Pink Poodle. And I used to bring, you know, all the, well, not all, but a number of the headliners, some people who were fairly big. You know, I took them to the Pink Poodle, and it was a way of meeting these comics and kind of getting in with them by taking them to the strip club. And occasionally I would talk to them into doing a set at, at at the Pink Poodle, which, you know, if you've ever done um, comedy in a strip club, it's probably one of the more uh, challenging environments. <laughs> I could imagine. I could imagine. Yeah. Because you're probably in between sets for the for um, the dancers, am I correct? No, yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's you know, they're, they're generally not there to see you. Yeah. <laughs> generally. <laughs> yeah, the audience, yeah. yeah. And, uh, generally not. Say, I wasn't really and bringing them crowd. <laughs> and not only that, they had no idea that not just that they weren't there to see you, probably that there is anybody talking at all, let alone trying to entertain, let alone trying to entertain through the spoken word and comedy and all that stuff. Had to be very tough gig. I can, um, I can well and imagine. It, you, you would really hone your, um, you know, your, your heckler defense in a place like that. I mean, you, you had to really learn how to deal with hecklers and be able to learn how to shut people down um, in that environment. And, you know, it, right. it, it, it was one of those things. And I, I felt like that I, I got so much early experience, you know, doing comedy. I, I would, you know, go up and do five minutes, you know, not a good five minutes. We're talking early on, you know, and then bring up the next act and, you know. Right. It, 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 it was one of those things that you had to you, you had to learn how to control the room, and it it yeah. was very helpful and, for me. Uh, it, it, it really was helpful. Having a stage, it's having a, the ability to to do that, and you could either do it with a look or you know the pace of your voice or whatever it takes, and you don't have to be a big six six guy to do that either. No, not at all. Uh, we mentioned uh, we're talking about Ben Stewart, who would get up in the wheelchair and have people looking at him and listening to him, and um, he was quite a guy. Uh, rest, rest in peace, uh, Stewart. He, he could. He really learned how. He really knew how to work that uncomfortableness that his, you know, presence um, would would bring out in people, and it was amazing to see. You know, you could feel how uncomfortable and see how uncomfortable even here 
you know, you know, people saying things, you know, right when he would go up there. And um, he was able to disarm them and deal with them and, you know, do his act. And, and he was funny. And, you know, he, I, I had so much respect for him. He funny. He wasn't up there yeah. as, a, as some sort of mascot or any, anything. No, or a novelty or anything like that. It's, yeah. I mean, he had some jokes, you know, around his size and around his disability, but, but, but basically, you know, his observations and, you know, his, the building of his jokes and his transitions and, you know, I mean, he, he, you know, really was good. And well, he was a well. I think all that happened to be lit, but professional. He, yeah, and he, he was. And, you know, I, I enjoyed I mean. spending time with him and, um, I, I'm, I'm very proud to have called him my friend and, you know, yeah. missed him greatly when he, when he left and, you know, and that's, that's, you know, it's one of those memories of San Francisco. He, uh, out of San Francisco, he, you know, a very strong memory for me. So, um, and another one of my favorite now, you're, stories. You're in Maine. Uh, you're in Bangor, literally in Bangor. Maine. What do you do to get by? How does it? How does it work? Um, I, I do. I do a number of things. Um, you know, I, I, um, I uh, got married. Well, we got married five years ago. But we, our child was born in 2002. And oh, wow. when I, when I, uh, when I had a child, it was time to kind of go, okay, I can no longer, you know, live my artistic, you know, rebellious, you know, um, wild lifestyle. I've got to be responsible for this child. And, you know, so I, I do what I have to do. Um, I do a lot of, um, service work, you know, satellites and fuel systems and, you know, I fix things. So I can, huh. I kind of go around and fix things and that's what I'm doing here. Um, but I also, um, something that I started years ago when I was in San Francisco really, uh, was making lamps, you know, designing lamps and candle holders. And, um, I kind of put that on the shelf for a while. And then, uh, from the summer before last, I finally carved out a space to start making things again. And this year I produced a number of decent pieces and created a website and, you know, doing the whole thing again. And, uh, Tell the folks what the website is. This is shameless self. This is this is, this is ChristopherWhiteDesign.com. Um, there's, there's another Chris White that makes boats, but that's not me. <laughs> so, okay. not, not the most not the most uh, uh, uncommon name apparently, but right. it, it, um, it's something that, okay. that I really enjoy. It's, it's a great creative uh, process for me, and you know and. And the best part about it is that I don't have to worry about getting, you know, yelled off stage. So it's uh Wow, it's that's terrific. Thing. I don't know if you remember, because I had a child when in 1990. Um, yeah. Um, if you remember Diane Satin, who was a fellow comedian. Yeah. Comedian, her and I bred little Philip, who is all grown at 26. Wow. Photographer and... Um, yeah, cool kid, cool adult, nice to have had the experience. I was the stay-at-home dad for uh, the first five years of his his life, and, um, oh, it was terrific. I'll never forget it. And um, so you, you're going through it with yourself. and uh, Yeah, it's, it's an amazing process, you know. It, 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 it changes it's really your and It makes you concerned about the world after – you're gone after one is gone. Absolutely. I mean, if it wasn't for my, if it wasn't for my child, I would, I would just be watching this going, whatever, you know. I mean, not yeah, that I wouldn't be concerned or feel for it, That's but it's like, you know what? I'm, I'm in my mid fifties, you know. I can uh, drink up or whatever, and I'll you know, make stuff, and what's going to happen is going to happen, and you know, you know, and you know, it is what it is. But with a child, like you said, it's like, oh my God, what have we done? You know, where are we going with all this? And, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's yeah, watching this process. It's fucked up it is in, in one yeah. show. <laughs> it's just uh, amazing. Who to thunk? People misjudged two things. They misjudged Hillary's untrustworthiness. It's immense. And I agree. they misjudged the desperation, desperation of the um, people in the inner cities in Detroit and the uh, Cleveland, that their economy has just been destroyed, and the illusion that things are back to uh, 
um, pre-Obama days with Bush, and you know, it was so so terrible. And that he turned the economy around; it's great now. You know, it's much better, and he would have done much better if he wasn't obstructed every time chance he got to do something. They wouldn't even let him. The Supreme, the last Supreme Court justice, they. Oh. That's not going to go through. That's a disgrace, all of it. Oh, it's but, absolute disgrace. And, but at the same time, though, I, I, I'm disappointed um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I, 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 never, I never thought that he was going to be some great progressive um, savior. You know, I, I knew that he was more centralist than, than anything else, and I don't even know what that means nowadays, given the, you know, given the environment, given our last two candidates you know, that we've had here. But... Right. You know the, the fact that he surrounded himself um, with Wall Street people, and you know, and 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 the fact that he never, you know, he he would speak out, but eh, you know, he, he he always tried to kind of, I don't even want to say appeasement, but I, I want to say that he always tried to work. Sometimes, you know, you're not going to be able to to compromise. Sometimes you need to really make a stand, and you know, as as president, especially when you're president when when you don't control the House, you either have to either, um, either the Senate or the House. And I just, maybe it's just not in his nature to really go to war like that and, and you know, with, you know, out, out in public. But that's, uh, he really needed to do that. Reach but he out, didn't. number one, and they, and there, it magnifies the, or at least illustrates the prejudice. The pure out and out, they hate him because he's a black man. That's Absolutely. Crazy. It's just so blatant, and um, it's disgusting. <laughs> Let's put it that well, way. It, 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 you could even go so far as to say, there, you know, even just within the House and the Senate, that there are um, congressmen and senators that hate him because he's black. A- absolutely. There's also, you know, those congressmen and senators, um, some of them Democrats as well, that plays into that. You know, they don't care either way. It's, it's about their power. It's about their, you know, financial um, growth, whatever, but they played into it. They they encouraged that because it helped them. They're, they're, they're enablers they helped them. for those. Yes, yeah, absolutely, and and they profited from it, you know. And and um, well, yeah, but th- but, but there the are biggest, a few things that when we're talking about Obama, you have to mention the droning, you have to mention the ecology, the fracking, and you absolutely, have to, and you have to really mentioned that the most important part to me was Monsanto, the sellout to Monsanto. We are the only civilized country in the world that has uh, literally that gives in to Monsanto. They're changing the, our food to the point where it's just like Soylent Green. They just it really they, is. Don't, they don't it's want people. you to live. It's people. It's right. people. <laughs> it's a crazy it, it, world. Um, and, and there's definitely that. And that's, that's a long-term thing. Um, and, and you write right about the groaning, and it's the extrajudicial killing of people that, that it should be just, you know, where are people getting upset about that? You know, you know, it doesn't matter how bad of a criminal you are. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, every every American citizen, I think every person, Period. But every American citizen has the right to, you know, to a fair trial. And just because they're in another country and, and maybe, you know, attached to, you know, something that's messed up, it doesn't mean that you have a right, that I, being the government, to kill them. And, you know, we, we, the United States has done that on multiple occasions. American citizens let's killed by drones. On so let's make sure okay. that Trump gets a fair trial on his racketeering charges. And be sure right. to get him, get him a, a fair child when he raped a 13 year old. Which, the, and that again, if you say it that way, he raped a 13 year old. No. He had a, there was a 13 year old prostitute there at this party. Was she 13 in the traditional way that we think about it? Um, and how much is going to take to buy her off, buy the witnesses off, buy the judge off? He ain't, right. going to, he ain't going to go to jail for this. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I don't know how much we'll hear of again, you know, <laughs> quite honestly. Right. I, well, um, 
Well, they should. They're, they're both trials are on the docket. The other one is the racketeering charge, basically, it is, for what he, uh, the money he defrauded students in Trump, and I put it in quotes, you can't put it in quotes without using that little hand signal, quotes. <laughs> Um, and you can't do that on the radio. You try I hit the phone to do that, and nothing works. But you, but you, you make the emphasis, you know. Trump in, University. In the yeah, Trump University, but right. they that's settled now. It settled, right? Oh, it, it, it really it settled. Settled for like twenty five million or something like that. It's settled. See where that's going. Um, but you know, I I, I just I just to, to carry on to that no, Trump money, uh, money University. Will, um, if it, money, no pun. Money trumps it all. So that's settled. He just threw some bucks against it that he didn't want to before. He denied before, and now, boom! Jeez, we're fucked. Yeah. Uh, so you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of people upset with the idea of the electoral college, given the fact that you know Hillary Clinton will probably end up with a million or two million more votes somewhere in there, in you know, in popular vote than Trump did. And, but of course, he wins the electoral college. My thought here, for those people anyway, is that why don't we allow Trump to run the Electoral College? That way we know it will be defunct by the time January comes around and uh, we'll see what the result is. This is why I'm not in comedy anymore. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> that's a, but you have a comic's mind. You could just look at the absurd. What, what did, uh, do you remember J- Cantu, John Cantu? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, I never took a class, and and, and I, you know, I, he he was never a big fan of mine, and you know, I, I was kind of indifferent towards him, um, but uh, he, you know, I I didn't dislike the guy or anything at all. I just it just wasn't my scene, and it wasn't just he wasn't somebody that, um, and he was an extremely he just colorful. Just happens character. to be one of the most, what good, bad, or indifferent. He was one of the most interesting people. Absolutely. I I mean, just an absolute, he's one of those guys, he was what I look at, Larry David in in his show, he was that way, he, without the success, he was that way, he's one of those people, it is going to be my way, or the highway, but, That's it. and in every little thing, but, but he can brush off self-criticism, as easily as Larry David. That's the best way I can describe it. He could just look at you could talk to him and you could call him on something that that he was that was so outrageous and he'd just look right through you and go right on like uh okay. <laughs> That's just it I enjoyed his company. Another guy, rest in peace. Wow and did, you, it's been a, did you did you ever spend any time at the Rose and Thistle? I'm quite sure you did. I, I did. I spent quite yeah. quite a lot of time at the Rose and Thistle. As a matter of fact, um, I have fond memories of, of that. Another venue Brian for Funigan. yeah, Brian Funigan, a, um a very nice man. I, he went to L.A. I have lost contact with him. Um, I don't remember what what happened to him, but um, I don't do that. Yeah, um, I, nice. that was the first place I did comedy in San Francisco. I, I, oh, I okay. basically, I, I basically pulled into town and got, you know, got the the Chronicle and the Pink section and looked for clubs and and uh, the Rose and Thistle was open mic and I'm like, that's where I'm going. I didn't even have a place to stay yet, and and I went to the Rose and Thistle and um, Albert Lee was emptying the room that night and uh, I. Got up, I believe, but it was like at the end of the night, and there was literally no one left in the room, and I went and did a set anyway, just into a blank room. Um, but that was my first uh, night in San Francisco, moving there. Um, well, I met my I son, was... Diane Satin. I met uh, my son's mother there. So um, it was uh, that's good memories for me. The son Were you there for the um, Brian Holtzman so brawl? Certainly all of the Diane Satin part. But um, but certainly the sun part. We um, were you there? Do you remember? And I don't remember if you were there or not for the, the, the brawl, the, the Brian Holtzman brawl. Brian, Do you remember that? I remember that name. Of, I, I I hadn't thought 
of that name in a long time? No, I wasn't there for the brawl. Was there a fight or what was that? About? Yeah, there was this group. Um, Marty Maceda was there for that, and I think Kurt Weitzman was there. Um, a number of people, Jim Tripp. Um, uh, there was this group, and I'm trying to think what they were called, but they, they were really kind of just, you know, uh, their, their whole gig, and remember, this is in the late 80s, um, but their whole thing was the videotape, you know, uh, they, they would plant the audience with, with people, give them all tomatoes and things to throw, and, and try to create confrontation and videotape it, and try to sell those tapes. And, and that's what this group was about. And, and I, you know, I kind of saw what's going on. I thought, you know what, I'm not going on stage. And uh, Brian was up there, and um, I remember yelling at him. And if you remember Brian Holtzman, he uh, he guy. thrived on, on yeah, he he, he, thr- he thrived on on upsetting an audience. Um, and right. you know, I've got a Brian Holtzman story, but you know, and he really got them wild. And uh, somebody. Kind of right where I was, stood up and just threw and hit him with a tomato, and and you know and and a hard tomato too. <laughs> it, it bounced off him, and um, and I, I I've always been really uh, protective of my friends, and uh, I got up to confront that guy, and I'm kind of from a, you know, and he kind of went across the room, and I went with him, and and next thing I know, I'm getting punched from like this guy that was running one of the cameras and a couple other people, and the whole room just just erupted and, and wow. I mean it, it turned into this this this, this thing and I, I, I think it was Jim Tripp that was on that went up on page like everybody needs to calm down. You need to calm down <laughs> <laughs> And and Brian Funnigan was just you know completely freaked out and I can you know, imagine. It, yeah, it, they, uh, Brian would would rent basically the top uh it was a bar. And yeah. uh, he'd rent the venue, um, and um, he would be responsible for the, the liquor and the, the whole thing. And um, but it wasn't his restaurant to to mess up. No. So I could, it wasn't his bar to mess up. So I could imagine um, Brian Finn, a little guy who was um, <laughs> I could imagine his reaction to a brawl in the bar in the middle of the night because um, <laughs> that's the way it was. It's a good place to, to learn your craft. It, it, it really was. It, it, it kind of was the, um, the uh, pre, not the precursor, but but like uh, the junior league to the zoo. You know what I mean? I mean, we, we were really fortunate in those days. Um, right. I said it, well, what, that's what, what, um, golden age the, comedy. Cantu, as a matter of fact, we're talking about John Cantu, had that venue before Brian Funnigan, as a matter of yeah. fact. So um, he brought a, a certain audience. Or, you know, there are folks that, it was like the, the minor leagues of hockey, watching guys coming up and getting better. Um, everybody would come, come over and do a set there. I watched... Um, I uh, get yeah. Curry work at the night before the comedy competition that he won. Mm. He um, he worked out at um, at that club that <laughs> I'm blanking on now. It's getting late, you know. I'm an old man. Um, <laughs> at at uh, the Rose and Thistle, as a matter of fact, hanging on my wall. I don't know if you remember, there was a velvet made Rose and Thistle. Sign. Yeah, so, you, you've got that, do you? I, I want it back. Well, <laughs> that was cool. You it, know man. what? I'm, I, I'm I don't know if you have, but you would post this. You throw to a tomato at me, and I'm calling Brian Holtzman, and uh, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, um, I, I did a gig with Brian, um, the the rodeo. Um, at this club, so you know there was the the, the, the Cow Palace host. I don't know if it still does, but it used to host the rodeo every year. You know, and uh, yes, um, it did. I remember that very, very well. We, I, and, as a matter of fact, it was a station WNEW in in San Francisco. Yeah. I had a friend, a woman friend, um, who well, she was a woman and she was friendly. <laughs> to call um, was a producer at KNEW would get us tickets to. They were uh, the country station in those days. 
um, and would get us tickets to that event. And that was um, enjoyable, the Rodeo. I don't know if they still call it that. Some I don't know what they call it. They still do it. But I, I, there's a, a, a room or a club, and uh, they had booked um, bands and comics. And Brian and I were, were two of the comics, and I think we each made like 100 bucks or something like that, which is pretty good for, you know, especially for me at that yeah. point, and getting paid at all. Yeah, thing. paying gig um, at in the early days of doing stand-up is something that you're always going to remember for a number of reasons. Absolutely. First of all, the headset, they pay me to tell jokes. So yeah. Pay, uh, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> think about it. If you think about it in your own head, you say, wow, they paid me. I stood there, didn't work, paid, got paid for jokes. And um, so that's a good mindset. It's tough to, um, for the rest of your life, to yeah, to well, yeah. work. I'm just going to tell a few jokes today. I'm sorry, boss. I got nothing for you but uh, a tight five. So, you have a tight uh, five? It's a tight five. Not, we're not, we're not all loosey goosey here. This is a tight five. I will earn right. my money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, I'm Brian and I go to do this kid. Brian and I go to do this kid. Can you give me the red light right before lunch? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me, give me, give me the light at, at, uh, at 11.59, because that way I right. can, I can, you know, pound it out. Give you a work lunch. ethic <laughs> joke that, yeah. that one of my, our friends from back then, uh, Steve Rosenfeld, oh, yeah. had, had the greatest joke. I remember people by their best jokes, so, so to speak, um, uh, sometimes. Steve Rosenfeld says, I took an aptitude test, to, and the only thing I'm good for work-wise is to stand around and make sarcastic remarks while other people work. <laughs> um, Steve Rosenfeld my favorite Steve Rosenfeld joke went something like um, uh, you're referring to the fact that he's Jewish and he says you know a lot of people say that uh, the Jews killed Christ we didn't kill Christ in self defense he came at us with a knife he, he, uh, he came at us with, came at us with a knife he said it was self defense he came at us with a knife that's very good Yes, that's so. My Steve Rosenfeld never had Steve Rosenfeld help me move. I had him help me move once, and I had this like old bourbon in one of those um, ornate um, Florida shell um, containers. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was like old old bourbon, and it was sealed, and it was and it was in the eighties, and it was thirty years old, and it was like my one of my best prized possessions. And Steve Rosenfeld basically looked at it. Broke the seal, opened it up, and smelled it. I'm like, you just broke the seal. Yeah, it smells pretty good. It's like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I never forgave him for that. Never forgave him. <laughs> Are you seriously angry? I'm just curious. Probably. Nah, not. But it was, but it was, it was fun to, um, um, I mean, I, I, I guess I was honestly, I wasn't happy that he did that because it was a 30 year old bottle of, right. of, I know, of, but, you know, yeah. but it was, it, 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 it was just like, you know, it, you know that was sealed, right? You, you, you know that it, that it loses value if you break the seal. Do you understand that? Huh. Huh. Let's drink it. <laughs> Might as well drink well, it now. I, 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 after that, yeah, after I would share it with, you know, I, I, in fact, I shared some with Lance Solo, and I shared some with Kurt Weitzman, and any number of different people got a little bit of that stuff. That was, yeah. It was actually pretty good. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Good memories. So those, those were those were great days, and um, they were hard. indeed. And um, I'm glad you were a part of it. I'm glad you came back to, you know, just uh, just mourn with me. You know, just uh, we're get, getting through. I, I think, yeah. you know, to try to say something good about Trump at this point is is silly, but he does seem to be saying. Fewer stupid things. <laughs> Somebody, um, and he's making overtures to concession. He's saying things like he really wants to amend rather than 
dispose of Obamacare. So Well, I think he realizes that that would be impossible to dispose of. It, it, it's, of it's, course. You know, it, it's like, yeah. you know what, I want to I get rid of, you know, the veins, you know, in my body. And, you know, well, yeah, you, you can't get rid of the veins in your body. You can't, you know, you're dead. So, you know, yeah, Obamacare, right. for better or for worse, is, is part of the system now. Um, you're not getting now, he's food. also coming back towards almost um, rational thinking when he's saying, well, I admit that putting up a wall through the, the whole thing will put up barriers. He's got barriers already up. But <laughs> a fence he's barriers, barriers, and there'll be a place we can, there'll be some places we're going to need a wall. To, he'll keep his ego. He'll come to some sort of, of um, a compromise with it. And he's not going to dispose of 80 million illegal immigrants by Thursday. And we need people in. He doesn't realize that um, the agricultural, cultural California, Texas especially, um, depends on illegal immigration. And the construction industry and, you know, I mean, and certain manufacturing industries and restaurants and, you know, it, it's it, it would it for for rational thinking people it would make more sense to find a way to legitimize um, and not you know people aren't illegal. I don't care you know if to call somebody illegal is is a, is a really um, horrible backwards way of thinking. And you know, it, it, but there's a way to legitimize you know adds the tax base. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much you could do with that. That, that would do so much into to growing, you know, our culture and growing the economy, for that matter. And I, I don't understand why and people don't you gotta, that. you've got to not split up families. Like, you can have two people who are illegal immigrants. They come over here. They have a child. The child's born in America. Now, what are you going to do? Send, send the parents back? Keep the child here? There's craziness going on. But you know what? To sum it up and how... The situation, how we got into the situation that we are in now. Everybody has to remember, this country was founded by slave owners. Correct. So it, and we have been on an imperialistic rage since Plymouth Rock. So Absolutely. Now, this shit, this shit shouldn't surprise us. We should just be, should have been more prepared for the obvious. It's going to go on. It's the it's the way we do things, and the the system needs changing. It's not the individuals that run. It's the system that produces the individuals because they're both cretins. So it's both parties, and yeah. um, we have to. Bernie said it. Bernie said it best. And if we look to what caused Trump to be in there. It was Hillary's, it was the Democratic Party giving the Queen the throne at the beginning. And media. So I, I, Hillary, the DNC, and, and the Democratic Party, and media. That's, that's what created Trump, and that's what allowed you know, Trump to get, get power. And well, it, it's, you know, both sides. Not, when Debbie Wasserman Schultz came out, the emails came out that Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the head of the DNC, fixed the primaries. She should have resigned and said, "Hey, we're going to give it to give it to Bernie." That we, you know, Absolutely. that's it. Yeah, um, a and when Trump made that little thing with the with you know, I'm making fun of the disabled guy with his arm and all that, and then he met with the Muslim family who lost their son defending fighting on our side, our, in quotes again, yeah. the United States of America, and he, in pu public, down those people and, and dished those people. If the core of the United States didn't say, right then, we can't vote for either of these two TV, it all came about right about the same time. We just can't. Yeah. We have to do it again. We need, and all these protests are, are saying that they're going on and on and on. It's been 
How many days? It's been 12 days, and they're still protesting. Yeah. There's still dissatisfaction. There's still damage to be done in major cities by these people every day. And all that shit is just a backlash of people who want to get into protesting. So the real protesting gets lost. They go, oh, it's a bunch of thugs. No, they're not thugs. They're unhappy people with the situation. They don't want to be identified as citizens of a country that could allow something like this election to happen. And um, I'll tell you what, before this, before this real revolution in the streets, you got to solve the problem that, um, I mean, this could easily turn into Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, 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 you have to, I mean, you know, you know, you know, being kind of a, a, a geek for history, um, you have to, there's, there's certain things to look at. And, but to, to, to what you're talking about, you look at 2000 and the fact that people didn't freak out and go into the streets because of, you know, the Supreme Court in Florida and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the fact that they allowed that to happen and, but, but it, you know, so many people were waiting for Al Gore to say something, and he just didn't seem to care. You know, he just allowed it to happen. And, you know, and then John Kerry four years later, but, but especially with Al Gore. Once John 2000 Kerry happened, not going to, he said that John Kerry said that if he lost, he had a, um, a team of attorneys because it was right. in Chicago. To, um, it was Illinois, and it was the voting machine. And the person that owned the voting machine had this thing, it was patented, you couldn't get into the voting machine to see what was going on. And he yeah. also had come out with something that said, we're going to ensure that um, Bush is the, is the president. And yeah. um, made that offhand remark. And the contract was that you couldn't get into those machines, that nobody that owned them, and, and all of a sudden... And Gore said, if I lose, I got my, my attorneys. They were in place, and he did not protest the election. Some Absolutely. Got to him. I think my – it goes back to the Chads and the C and Florida. I think when push comes to shove, the CIA will go, come in, just like, just like the CIA had to have gone to the members of the Supreme Court and said, look – He's going to be prez. I mean, we had to. We had. Well, it, maybe it, 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 maybe it's CIA. Other I, I think it's more than yeah. I, I think it's even more than that. And and you know the point that I was going to make with, when they were when an election was that corrupt and that foul that they didn't do it over or they didn't you know that it caused havoc and people didn't freak out and rebel against that. It's, that was like going. Hey, wow! I can get away with anything I want, and then ever since they have the tone, you know, absolutely, it is. That's the tone for Wasserman to be able to say, you know, I, my girlfriend and I, we sat there over that primary ballot. It took a while to do it. We took ten minutes out of our lives. It was so important to us to vote for Bernie. We were so yeah. able to do that, and then it comes out and said, thing was fixed, and. Because he's an atheist, they use those words. Instead right. Of it, no, he's Jewish. He's a socialist. He's Jewish. <laughs> if you say yeah. it that way. Yeah. Does, it doesn't, yeah. well, he's an atheist. He doesn't, well, he's not an atheist. He's an agnostic, as a matter of fact. So right. they even misrepresented that. Um, it, it was just, um, it was tragic. And when they did the best car road. You know, I mean, they just, they just, they just all loaded in there. And, you know, yes. I mean, they screwed them. They screwed them in New York. They screwed them in Nevada um, and, and a number of other places. You know, people lost, you know, had their right to vote taken away from them. You know, they were purged from polls. I mean, you're going to really tell me that Bernie would lose Brooklyn? I mean, you know, get out of here. Bernie, <laughs> Bernie made some key mistakes in the debate with Hillary in New York. One I don't think it was that big a mistake. Um, Tell me, but I, I I didn't think so. But but go ahead. Well, he allowed Hillary to appear to be more pro-Israel than he was. Hillary, in fact, is less pro-Israel than Trump, and he, she said some mishy-mashy thing stuff in her defense. But she also made a case for the Israelis and the Palestinians. 
against the Palestinians, and Bernie sat there. Now. Okay, yeah, I, I, I definitely will give you that. That was a bad, just from a tactical standpoint in New York, that was a bad tactical move. Another thing is, Hillary comes out and says, and it was really true, Bernie gave in in Vermont to the NRA. Had to. It's a different world, this, that, and the other thing. But Hillary had a point. Hillary had said in that debate that there were guns purchased in Vermont, used in New York, in crimes. And well, and there are there are guns that come from Maine, and there are guns that come, you know, living in Vermont. Absolutely. Everybody's got guns. And it's, Everybody's it's, it's got guns. But it was so wet. He just didn't know how to respond to that. It was... No, and he should have. I, I agree. And, and she also snuck in the thing. Uh, all of a sudden, she's waxing poetic about poor Israel, quote, end quote. Um, and it, that made me a little leery, but a little realistic, too, as... See, as a Jew myself, I can't be objective about stuff, and no one can because we all have our special interests about things. I could yeah. vote for either, but I um, we kept vastly. I was lucky. We were in California. We live in California, and we voted for Jill Stein, and it, we knew that Bernie was so far ahead in California, not going to mess up a thing. Voting right. for Jill Stein, maybe she'll get 5%, maybe we will get a, a third party into the debate. I was off the hook. But if I lived in a different state where it mattered whether or not I voted for one of the Cretans or the other, I wouldn't know what to do. I still couldn't make up my mind if you asked me today, who is the worst candidate, Hillary Clinton or Trump? And that's where the problem yeah. comes from, is it's not the candidates, it's the system that produces the candidates. And until um, somebody can do something about that... Um, well, we, we, you know, and what do you do? There's a, there's a number of things that you have to do. You know, Citizens United has to be overturned. Um, you need to have public financing of campaigns and, and have, have a limit. They're, you know, part of your FCC license, for instance, would be to give you know, a certain amount of time to each candidate. We need to have debates that aren't controlled. You need term limitations party. on Congress people. You could only Absolutely. let them get. We could only let them get so rich. And I, I, I totally agree. Has to share the lobbyists in a fair way. Like when a tobacco <laughs> person comes in, <laughs> you got to listen to them in a fair way. The alcohol person comes. Everybody gets their say, but it's got to yeah. be equal. And gotta here's equal. another thing. It has to be against the law to accept money from corporations in your, in your campaigns. That's just, so you have to get big, big business out of it somehow. Because because that's not a First Amendment issue, and and that's kind of what what their argument is is that well you know you know my corporation you know this company has a right to support whoever it wants. It's, it's freedom of speech. Yeah, well you know if for as much as they want to make corporations into people, they're not people. And, you know, and it's been and the slow. People, and, and as much as they want to have millionaires represent us, how, what percentage of Congress is made up of millionaires? And how can Almost a millionaire all of them. represent Johnny <laughs> Lunchbucket? There's no way. You go to a country club, you have a driver, and you're going to tell you're going to represent me? You're going to walk a mile in my, my shoes? I saw the, the dissatisfaction in the people. Comedians have to play to the common denominator of what's on their, the audience's mind. So you do sure. that for the rest of your life when you think about things. I taught traffic school for a lot of years. I have yeah. a bunch of people in front of me. I know how people feel about stuff on the road. <laughs> I, um, you don't, don't have to tell me. People misjudged the dissatisfaction of the, the United States. You know, we're not recovered. People had great jobs, union jobs with benefits, and they're working for crap now. And, you know, a lot of people... Absolutely. Are, 
A- absolutely. I mean, you can't, you know, I mean, if you've ever driven through Ohio or Pennsylvania or, you know, a lot of places in the Northeast, Michigan you know, I'm, and all that, that's what appealed to the Trumpites. That's what got him elected. Um, the, the inner cities, it's, it's horrible. And, oh, it's absolutely um, horrible. And it, it, it's, and, and, you know, they act like, well, you know, Hillary acted like that, that really didn't exist. And, and, you know, the, and the other places that Hillary really, as you said earlier, um, really just acted like that the dissent, the dislike for her wasn't real. And the Democratic Party acted like that wasn't real. And there were people going all over the place saying, look, people don't like her. They really don't like her. Well, that's just because of right wing, blah, blah, blah. No, people really don't like her. And, you know, yeah, and not she didn't. Much. No. I think and she didn't, was. you know. That's the scary part. You know, picking somebody like Tim Kaine, um, for instance, you know, and supposedly she picked him over a year ago. So there was no, you know, you know, competition to find the VP. It was Tim Kaine from the very beginning. And, you know, I mean, it's, I think it was pretty amazing that anybody that had supported Bernie voted for her at all. And a lot of that was out of fear. People voted for her out of fear. Fear is really not going to – Trump didn't have fear. There was a lot of people – now, granted, um, I, I – I wonder how many people voted for Trump out of their complete dislike or hatred for Hillary Clinton. And I bet it wasn't a small amount, you know. And um, I, I don't think well, that everybody that voted for Trump is a racist and, and, and that type of person. A lot of them, probably. Well, and I saw a documentary or, or a news clip tonight. There's a very interesting to note that, speaking of him being a racist and an anti-Semite in, in particular, his daughters – are either engaged or married. Um, one daughter is married to a very, very big shot in Goldman Sachs or whatever, and right. a big part of his administration. Right. Two of his sons are married to Jewish women. So all the talk about him being an anti-Semite is certainly out of place from that, that standpoint. Um, uh, we'll see if he comes back to center. They say that everybody that's ever been elected always goes, if they come from the left wing, they go towards the middle. If they come from the right wing, they go towards the middle. But I have one goal. we got to keep Ruth Ginsburg alive. I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Up, we'll put her in a bubble. I'll, I'll send a dollar if everybody sends a dollar. To keep her going, I'll tell her stories. I'll make her laugh. I'll make her wish she was alive. Tell her her grandkids <laughs> lived and have a fire. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> I, I, she can do I mean, four years. She can do four years. Have, you know, it, it, that's all. That, uh, that's right. But it's more than everybody misjudges that. They say four years. Yeah. It's four years plus a month and a half. So we got. Sure. It's. A, I don't want her to quit. It's just four <laughs> years. That, um, that's true. And if we can do that, it'll be a better world. Um, Chris, thank you for being here. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. I, I, I enjoyed this immensely. Um, oh, I, I, that's I, nice. I love that's following nice. you online. And, um, hey, check out my website, and, you know, Christopher White Design. Say it again for everybody so they know. ChristopherWhiteDesign.com. So no S in designs. It's design. Uh, Thank you. I will send design. you, com. within the next few days, I will send you a picture of the um, velvet thing on my wall. Absolutely. I'm holding you to that. And yeah. we didn't even talk about baseball. So we, we have to talk oh, again wow. about baseball. Christopher, um, I, I, uh, you know the Comfortably Zone radio network is never adverse to talking about baseball. Who's your favorite team? You're a Giant fan. Oh, I'm, I'm a Giant fan, you know. Well, through and through, Giants, and it starts and ends with the Giants, and I'm not even sure the names of any other teams. It's just the Giants. I know I hate the Dodgers, and I love the Giants, and that's that, and it's a lot of fun. It's an absolute. Uh, that's you know, exactly, it's and you could root, and um, it it's not like when you're rooting. Not life and death, and it, it, it no, no matter how bad it is, it's next. If you right. No matter that you were at the ball game, no matter when you think about it, how bad could it be? How bad can it be? Exactly. You know, the worst right. case, worst case, I'm yelling at Dusty Baker for that game six, but you know, that's, what are you going to oh. do? No, um, <laughs> I'm still a little upset that Branca complained so much about Bobby Thompson hitting the home. 
This little thing. Hey, shut up already, for Christ's sake. I'm going to end the show the way I always do, Christopher. I'm going to implore you and everybody out there to keep your dreams wet, keep your humor dry, keep your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting stations, Absolutely. and off the laps of clerics that wear dresses. Now, what? you don't have to do all four. I suggest you do. But even doing one or two or three, adding add that shit to your repertoire, it'll be a better life. Um, and keep on keeping on. Be well, Christopher. Thank you so much. All right. Adios, everybody. <laughs>